Hello everyone and welcome back to the program. If you were to go back in time 50 years, what a different world it would be, particularly in the world of television and entertainment. On TV in America, the most popular shows would have been My Three Sons, Ozzie and Harriet, and the Beverly Hillbillies. At the time, there was no profanity or sex on television. Characters wouldn't take God's name in vain or ridicule the Bible. The good guys always won, and criminals always went to jail. Now compare that with a typical evening of television today, whether in the United States or here in Great Britain. Television today is constantly churning out a flood of illicit sex and graphic violence. And with each passing year, the content just gets worse and worse. Is it all just innocent entertainment? Or is this an ugly reflection of our world today? And more importantly, what does your Bible have to say about this subject? The Trumpet Daily. There's a proverb that says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's in the book of Proverbs. You can look into the Gospels and see that Jesus talked about the evil things that proceed out from man, how that those things start in the heart. They start in the heart. So it does matter what we fill our minds with. And look at what so many people today are consuming, are feeding on mentally and spiritually. Look at what they're filling their minds with. Look at the images that fill the minds of the average American or the average Briton. This is an article that uh, appeared in the New York Post in the States. It talks about how TV shows are working to do anything to try to attract viewers. And to do that, they're making the content worse and worse. It says, for nearly two decades, we've been told that this is the golden age of television, the smartest, deepest storytelling, the most nuanced and morally complex characters are found here. Perhaps it's time for a reconsideration, the Post says. Today, the golden age is in the throes of an arms race with showrunners attempting to outshock their audiences week to week, churning out melodrama without consequence. They're trying to outshock one another. And then this article goes and gives some pretty graphic examples from programs, whether on paid TV like HBO or just regular old networks like ABC. It talks about one program on ABC, how that a, one of the, so the supposedly good characters takes a, an aluminum chair and beats uh, someone that's in a wheelchair, beats them to death. That's just regular programming on a weeknight on television in the United States. There's an HBO program, again in this same article, that talks about a, a junior high teacher that fully exposes herself in front of the class and that by doing this, she somehow saves her job because she was willing to do that, to go out on the edge, to stand up for her rights, her rights to freely express herself, I guess. There's another program on the USA Network where after an illicit sex act, one of the partners just strangles the other to death without really any reason whatsoever. That's common today. That's good programming in the world of today. In some cases, th these are award-winning shows. There's another program uh, called The Americans that features a grown man that's uh, seducing a teenager, a young teenager. That makes for plot lines on television today as well. And then one last one where a government employee in the U.S. Uh, marries a, a terrorist and then tries to kill the baby and then somehow still maintains her government position. Just crazy things like this. All sorts of stories about kidnapping and torture and dismemberment and rape. Even rape scenes are now becoming common in the world of television today. Is this really the golden age 
Or have we entered into a very dark age when it comes to entertainment, when it comes to television? This is continuing from the New York Post. It says, in a post-Sopranos landscape, moral transgression automatically signifies high art, infanticide, incest, pedophilia, matricide, torture, rape, castration, cannibalism, mass murder, all are now commonly employed tropes meant to signify quality. Well, this is quality today. Those kinds of themes, that kind of subject matter, and you have to ask yourself, do we really need to be watching programs about cannibalism, about incest, about pedophilia, about rape? Is that what we need to be filling our minds with? And, and as I said there at the top, what does God have to say about this? What's God's opinion? What does your Bible have to say about our pleasure-seeking world? About people who love pleasure? and seeking after pleasure more than they love God, as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3. Let me read for you what it says in Isaiah chapter 3, just to finish up this quote. It says, Each of these shows are peopled with characters that range from sinister to sociopathic. Anyone remotely sympathetic in these worlds is always the stooge, the too trusting idiot who elicits contempt from the audience. See, the good guys today, they're the idiots. They're the punchline. The joke's on them. Notice what it says here in Isaiah 3. This is verse 9. The show of their countenance does witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they've rewarded evil unto themselves. I mean, God's saying here through the prophet Isaiah, you should study the whole chapter, by the way. But he's saying there's no shame. We take pride in this anti-family culture. We take pride in this hostility to God and His Word. We put it out there on display. Isaiah is bringing up the example of Sodom and Gomorrah from the book of Genesis. And you know he's not alone in the Bible. In fact, you can go to the New Testament and see what Jesus himself said. You can see what the Apostle Peter had to say. You can see what the Apostle Jude had to say. And they, they all brought up that history. They were all trying to help us as students of God's Word to understand what happens when you just have rampant universal sin. What it leads to, it leads to destruction in every case. And that's why we ought to be very concerned about this. And not just brush it aside and say, oh, well, here goes another voice decrying all of the evils in, in our popular culture. It's just entertainment. What does it matter what we view, what we watch? Well, look at the world around you. Look at the real world. A lot of people don't want to look at the real world. They want to escape into this, this virtual world, this world of fantasy and make-believe. But in too many cases, what we see on television, what we see in the movies, it's a mirror image of what is actually happening in this world today with all of those disgusting themes of torture and rape and dismemberment and kidnapping and blackmail and beheadings. All those things are just becoming very common today. Let's switch over to the, the New Testament. The book of Romans. This is the Apostle Paul writing in Romans chapter 1. And we'll read verse 28. It says here, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge, and so what did God do? Well, He just gave them over to their reprobate minds to do those things that are, that are not convenient, the King James says, or other translations talk about those things that are just worthless, that are void of judgment, and even just common sense. Common sense would tell you that's not something we want just blaring out to the whole world. That's not something we would want our children to see. We don't want to fill our minds with those kinds of images. But, well, we have to declare that, it says in Isaiah 3. We declare those sins. We take pride in those sins. And the worse they are, and you know this is the case, the worse they are, the more critically acclaimed they'll be. The worse the subject matter 
the more likely that program is going to win some kind of an award. That's the world we live in today. It's upside down, isn't it? Verse 32, it says here, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. I mean, those who consent to the wrongdoing, Paul says, are just as guilty as those that are out there committing the act. Those that consent or provide their support or who cheer them on, just as guilty, God says, just as guilty, back up to the Gospels. Again, I mentioned that Jesus himself, just like Isaiah, brought up that example of Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice what Jesus says here. This is in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17 and verse 28. It says, Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted and builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. That's the lesson that Isaiah was trying to get across, that Jesus reminds us of here. Peter and Jude speak of it as well. That universal sin, widespread, rampant sin, it leads to widespread and universal destruction. That's why, as I say, we should be very concerned about the world we're living in today and about what we see when we turn on the television. Continuing in verse 30, it says, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. See, all of this is a sign, really. It's a sign that we're getting close to the day when Jesus Christ will be revealed, when Jesus Christ will return to this earth. This book here, this is by Herbert Armstrong, The Missing Dimension in Sex. I've been waiting to advertise this for, for some time now, waiting for the right opportunity. And this is it. Let me, let me show you what it, what it says in this book. It says, since, since it's a basic truism that a solid family structure is the foundational bulwark of any stable and permanent society, this fact means only one thing. Civilization as we know it is on the way down and out unless that great unseen strong hand from someplace soon intervenes and saves today's sick society. We need help. We need God's intervention. That's quite a statement Mr. Armstrong makes there in The Missing Dimension in Sex. I mean, the foundation of any stable society is the family. And that's what this book is about. The missing dimension in sex. Why did God create sex? Why did He make us male and female from the very beginning? Why did He ordain the institution of marriage and family? What was it all about? What did it point to? What was it meant to teach us? This is the dimension that's missing from all of the programming, even the so-called good programming, that doesn't have some of those, those terrible themes and plot lines that I just mentioned from that New York Post article. Still, there's so much missing. And it's talked about in this book. I hope that you'll request your own personal copy of Herbert Armstrong's book, The Missing Dimension in Sex. We'll be right back. If ever the Western world needed a new book, it needs this one now. That's how Herbert W. Armstrong began The Missing Dimension in Sex, his groundbreaking book on marriage and family. Conceived in 1949, originally as the textbook for his Ambassador College Principles of Living class, The Missing Dimension in Sex became a revolutionary expose on the sexual and cultural revolutions, along with their disastrous consequences, that swept the Western world after World War I. More than 1.5 million copies of The Missing Dimension in Sex have been distributed worldwide. Today, we are thrilled to offer it to you gratis, without cost. The Missing Dimension in Sex is a book about much more than sex. It is a guidebook for living. It's about God's purpose for man and how he is fulfilling that purpose through love, marriage and sex. Based on the sure word of God's immutable laws, The Missing Dimension in Sex is a guidebook aimed at singles and marrieds alike, at parents and their teenage children. Call now at 0800-014-8522 and request a free copy of The Missing Dimension in Sex. When you call, also request 
Why Marriage, Soon Obsolete. Both of these works, written by Herbert W. Armstrong, reveal the divine purpose behind marriage and family. Request The Missing Dimension in Sex and Why Marriage, Soon Obsolete. And if you haven't already, don't forget to enroll in the Armstrong College Bible Correspondence Course. It's a distance learning program that makes the Bible come alive. Well, you sit five and a half hours in front of television just watching these shows, many of which just carry you off into a sort of a dreamy dreamland of some kind and let your mind just wander wherever it takes it. How alert are you when it's over? Do you feel like going and studying your Bible? Are you in the mood of prayer? Do you feel like going into a private room and having a real heart-rending prayer with God? Do you feel like getting in touch with God and kind of very joy and the great, well, really joy and the happiness that comes with a real contact with God. Are you in the mood for that when you spend about five and a half hours in front of a television set looking at these shows, looking at all the murders and all of the things that you see? You know that you're not. That clip was from Herbert Armstrong from back in the 1960s talking about how many were wasting away precious hours every day watching television. The average American today watches about 30 to 35 hours per week. And then look at the content today as compared to the 1960s. Still though, like Mr. Armstrong brought out in that quote, in that clip that you just heard, how do you come away from that many hours each day filling up on that content that Hollywood is spewing out? How do you come away from that and really say, you know what, I really want to get close to God now. I'm really inspired spiritually. I want to pour my hearts into a, into a good prayer session with God. I really want to study the Bible. You don't come away from those plot lines today uplifted and inspired and ready to serve God in any way. Now look, I'm not saying there's no place for any kind of entertainment. We do need periods for refreshment and rejuvenation. But we're obsessed with it. That's the problem. And as, as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, we put that above seeking God, seeking pleasure, filling our lives, our time, our homes, our minds with hours and hours and hours. In some cases, with just the worst kind of content you could imagine. And it's driving us away from God. That's the truth. God says the way to counteract that is to turn away from the evil and to go and fill up on good things, on righteous things. To use that time that we used to use, obsessing over TV or music or movies, and to really set aside large chunks of time to serve and obey God, to learn about His ways, to study His laws. There was another article about just the content that this world is producing. In this case, it was pornography, and it talked about the recent Time magazine uh, feature that talked about how pornography is posing a threat to virility, as if that's the big problem with pornography, that it might hurt our sex life, when in fact pornography has destroyed families and it's destroying society. It's a lot worse than virility. It's about ripping apart marriages. It's about teenage boys being enslaved to an addiction that they'll, they're going to have to fight the rest of their lives to come out of. This is from that National Review piece about the Time Magazine feature. And he says here, I can't count the number of friends and neighbors whose marriages have been impacted by pornography. I've seen porn cause divorce. I've seen it cause years of heartache as couples struggle to rebuild frayed sexual and emotional bonds. Instant gratification is porn's mission and purpose. The concept of restraint is completely alien to the porn culture. 
And the very moment that the gratification is less than instant, there's always a new form of porn out there, ready to give the user his next high. The entertainment always has to ex escalate. Just like the New York Post piece. It just has to get worse and worse and worse. Well, they're trying to attract more viewers, you see. There's a lot of competition in the world of television today. And so everyone has to take it a step lower to go a little bit, a little bit deeper into this cesspool. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. God says, turn away from it. Just shun it. Notice Philippians 4 here, continuing our study. This is uh, Paul writing to the brethren at Philippi. He says, finally, brethren, finally, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these topics. Think on this subject. How many Hollywood, Hollywood screenwriters are turning to Philippians 4, 8 and thinking, you know what, I'm going to come up with a lovely script, something that's about a good report, something that's about justness and fairness. As it is, what do we see? Well, just the opposite. There's a saying, garbage in, garbage out. Fill up on garbage, and that's what comes out, as I said earlier in the program. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, the, the solution is to fill up on God's truth, to fill up on, on righteousness. The mind, just like nature, it, ab it abhors a vacuum. And so we've got to fill up on God's teachings, on God's truth. Now, there's too many verses really to rattle through. Some of the Psalms where King David talked about meditating on God's law day and night. There's a verse in Joshua 1 that shows how Joshua meditated on the law of God. Jesus, of course, the Apostle Paul. Again, King David in Psalm 119, he said, Oh, how love I thy law! How I love God's law! The only thing that Hollywood and, and other producers of entertainment today are there to declare is lawlessness. An anti-God message that's hostile to God's truth and God's word. As I said, how many plot lines are going to run with messages from the Bible? Messages from Philippians 4 and verse 8. We've got to fill up on these precious, precious words. Let me just play for you uh, one more clip. This is from uh, a program, once again, that Herbert Armstrong gave way back in the 1960s. Television brings across its message, whatever it may be, with terrific impact, both through sight and sound simultaneously. Very effective medium. But what are we doing with it? How are we using it? Oh, just to while away our time to amuse and entertain ourselves, most of us. Listen, it brings with it a tremendous responsibility on your part. And it's going to require a little bit of self-control and guidance over your children, over your own selves, as to whether you use it wisely. And it sure is an effective medium combining sound with, with visual. How effective that tool can be. We're using it, of course, right here and right now. But what are, as he said there in that clip, what are we doing with it? it? It takes a certain amount of responsibility on our part, particularly when we're raising children, raising them up in the way that they should go. We're going to have to be disciplined and temperate in all things, balanced, and learn how to use these powerful mediums the right way. Now going back to that first clip I, I played earlier, and just the mood that we come out of entertainment and, and seeking after pleasures and how that it really drives us away from God. If you think about the Christian life today and, and some of the towering figures of the Bible and how passionate and how zealous they were and how that they, they carried themselves through life with, life with this overpowering 
purpose and zeal for God. I mean, that's going to take some time and energy and interest. That's why we really need to carve out large chunks of time each day. And study works like this. This is another booklet. Why marriage? Why did God create the institution of marriage and family? What's its purpose? There's a tremendous vision in this book, and it's also discussed in The Missing Dimension in Sex. As I said earlier, these are valuable. These are valuable books loaded with instruction that you need in your marriage, that you need in your family. We all need to evaluate ourselves. Let's go over to just a couple more verses here before we conclude. Psalm 139, verse 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You've got to show me the way, God. Show me the way to go. Search me. Reveal all of the wickedness and help me to, to get it out of my mind, out of my thinking. There's another verse, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, that talks about bringing every thought into the captivity of Jesus Christ. I mean, you talk about obedience. You talk about filling up on righteousness so that then what comes out can be a real zealous and earnest and passionate Christian Prepared to serve God with his whole heart. Make sure that you write down the information that we'll give you here at the end to request your own copies of The Missing Dimension in Sex, Herbert Armstrong's wonderful book, and also his booklet, Why Marriage, Soon Obsolete. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.